It's finally time to meet up with everyone! Hi, money. Xavier said yesterday afternoon went well. Yeah, and how about you, Ayaka? What were you up to yesterday? After we split up, Ayato went to see Udex Nervilet at the Palais Marmonia. I was originally thinking of going with him, but he said he could manage it himself. He told me to go see the sights around Fontaine and to enjoy the local culture. So I rode the aqua bus at Yoimiya and visited the opera house on Erinias Island. Yeah, you wouldn't believe what we saw there! Two mechanical puppets that were dancing together! You've already seen them, right? Yeah, yeah, those two! Amazing, aren't they? We sat and watched for quite a while. It was mesmerizing, like we could keep watching them forever. Oh, it was the same for us the first time we saw them, too! Afterwards, we went swimming at the beach! Well, diving, to be exact. It was the first time I ever breathed underwater! I held Ayaka's hand and we counted down together. Three, two, one, and then... Splash! We were beneath the waves! First, I didn't dare to open my mouth. But once I couldn't hold my breath any longer, I decided to take a big breath in. <laughs> Turns out, the water wasn't as salty as I imagined. It didn't really taste like anything at all. Before I knew it, I was breathing like normal down there. It was an amazing feeling. Ayaka said I was too nervous and needed to loosen my grip. Uh, she got used to everything way faster than I did. I knew that the Traveler could do it, so I had no doubt we could do it, too. That helped me feel at ease as soon as we dove in. The underwater world in Fontaine truly is beautiful. I love seeing the Romaritime flowers blossoming underwater, like little candles lighting up the streets at night. Yeah, and there were so many creatures that we've never seen in Inazuma! Like those fish that shimmer like a sword blade. Whoosh! Oh, and those big fish that call when they see people. Ooh. Oh, you mean hunters, rays, and blubber beasts. <laughs> I just love the name blubber beast. Uh, just wait till Pops and the others hear about this. They probably won't believe a word I say. <laughs> Yoimiya was down there for quite a while. It was dark before we finally rode the aqua bus back to the city. I figured she'd want to sleep in today. <laughs> yeah, even I was worried that I wouldn't be able to get up. <sighs> I still felt like I was drifting in the waves when I went to sleep last night. But as soon as I woke up today, I remembered that we'd all be shooting a film together and I was ready to go. Speaking of the film, where's everybody else? My brother and Xavier were speaking to the restaurant owner about using the place as a filming location. They should be here soon. As for the others, they... We're here. Please excuse my tardiness. I just finished the Special Patrol's six-mile morning jog. Wait, six miles? Ugh, I'm so tired. I heard you all chatting, so I decided to come down. I sure could use some of that endless energy everyone else has. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Can someone fetch me a cup of coffee? More milk, hold the sugar. Sure, I'd be happy to do that for you. No, you can't go anywhere. Please, 
have a seat over here so I can get started on your makeup. Ugh, the last thing I want is coffee stains on my costumes. I can get the coffee! It's the perfect job for an assistant! Ugh, so much energy. Seriously, what's her secret? Oh, Yoimiya's always like that. But you sure look exhausted, Farina. It's because you're not used to waking up so early, huh? Of course not. I spent the whole night reading the novel from cover to cover, marking sections that either need to be omitted or adapted. Wow, Paimon didn't expect you to be so thorough. <laughs> well, I was the biggest star in all of Fontaine, after all. It takes more than just a pretty face to earn a reputation like that. I know how to get serious when the situation calls for it. I went all out when I was acting as an Archon, so why wouldn't I do the same for my own life? Here's your coffee, Dr. Farina. Thank you. Ah, the sound of being called director and the aroma of coffee <laughs> feels almost as refreshing as hearing the birds chirping in the morning. Oh, it seems everyone has managed to arrive on time. We've reached an agreement with the restaurant owner. We are free to use the second floor to shoot our film. He is really looking forward to our film, and hopes that providing his restaurant as a filming location will attract more customers. Well then, Mr. Xavier, I'll leave the rest to you. Okay, thanks! First, I'd like to introduce our new members. This is our prop manager, Veronique. She'll be in charge of all the films, props, and items. And this is Bono, our lighting technician. He'll be in charge of lighting and illumination to set up each scene's atmosphere. Wow. Sure feels like we have some real professionals joining the crew now. First of all, please allow me to first express my sincerest gratitude to everyone in the crew. When my investor informed me yesterday that he wouldn't be able to provide the funds, I really thought that this was the nail in the coffin for this film. I had no idea that I'd find so many people willing to help me on such short notice. Thank you. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. No need to be so cordial, Mr. Xavier. We're all honored to be a part of this. Your works made a profound impression on me when I saw them back in Inazuma. I am sure that someday, this film will be remembered as a prime example of cultural exchange between Fontaine and Inazuma. Yes. The story is the reason I agreed to join. I can't bear to even imagine what this film would look like without the very best director. Anyway, I would like to make a promise to everyone that as the producer of this film, I'll do whatever I can to ensure that everything goes as smoothly as possible. This is not just my film. It also embodies the thoughts and feelings of every person here, as well as the endless effort we are about to pour into it. <laughs> so, without further ado, the Two Musketeers will officially begin filming now! You may take it from here, Director Farina. All right. Listen up, everyone. The first scene takes place when the two young musketeers are living at the Baron's home, still unaware of all that is about to happen to them. We'll need props and lighting to set the scene. Our lead actors can go get their makeup done, and extras, please take this time to go over your positions. Whoa, seems Farina's really kicking things into gear as the director. Is everyone clear? I don't want anyone traipsing around the set like umbrella finches. All right, cameras will start rolling as soon as the set is ready. Let's make a film that'll make some serious waves in Fontaine. Uh, 
not the kind of waves that drown people. I mean, the good kind of waves. <laughs> uh, seems like she's still a bit traumatized by that. Anyway, let's go see if there's anything we can do to help. Here. Uh, a little more to the left. You got it. Hey, Yoimiya, do you need a hand? No, no, I'm fine. You know, doing the lighting is kind of like designing a fireworks show. It's interesting to imagine what kind of atmosphere the lights will create. I heard that the Traveler will be operating the camera and Paimon will be the clapper loader, right? <laughs> Those roles are just perfect for the two of you. Really? Is that because it'll be easy for Paimon to hold the clapperboard while flying? Well, sure, there's that, but that's not exactly what I meant. I just think that after all your journeys together, you two must have developed a super close bond and just naturally know how to work with each other. If I'm not mistaken, the director will want the cameras rolling as soon as the clapperboard goes clack. Oh, I see. <laughs> It's amazing to see the magic behind filmmaking. Yomiya, we need lights over there too. Oh, on it! I've got to get back to work. Chat with you later. Oh, it's exciting to see so many people working together to bring the film to life. Seems like Yomiya's really getting into it. But she was right. We do have a super close bond. Don't we? <laughs> Paimon's really happy to hear that. Ayaka has mentioned you to me before. She said that you two were great friends when you were kids. No talking. I'm thinking about how to do your eyeshadow. Ah, yes. To help me really look the part. To achieve a more young and naive look for this scene. Are you saying the wrinkles around my eyes are too deep? You just have too much of a calculating look in your eyes. <laughs> You sure don't mince your words. It seems you really haven't changed much. Quiet. So, this is a real musket? No, it's just a prop weapon. Not bad. Have you seen a real musket before? Only in books and newspapers. I made this one based on the relative shape and proportions I saw in reference images. When we're filming, some special gunpowder will be applied around the muzzle, which will help create the flash and smoke effects of a real gun being fired. Which means it'll be up to the actors to portray the recoil. <laughs> That's right. The sound effects for gunshots will also be added in post-production. Thank you, Veronique. I think I know where to start now. However, the musket's gears and firing pin could still use some work. Adding some wear on the metallic components will make them appear more realistic. Also, be sure to rub the muskets with some oil each time before we start shooting. That'll give the impression that the firearms have been well-maintenanced. Good point. You seem to know a lot, Miss Chevres. I assume you use these types of firearms on a regular basis? Yes, I perform routine maintenance on my weapons every day. Just like we as people need to eat and sleep, muskets need to be cleaned and maintained. I also perform similar care for my sword every day, and familiarize myself with its shape and weight, to the point where it feels like a natural extension of my body. Yes. This way, our weapons will never betray us in the heat of battle. Yes, well said. It seems we have the same philosophy on this topic. 
Oh, sounds like they found a common interest to talk about. Though these props differ from the muskets I use, I can still give you some pointers. Good. I look forward to your instruction. First and foremost, never point the weapon at anyone, regardless of whether it's a real or prop weapon or whether you're holding it or it's on the table. This holds for any time when you're not actively engaging an enemy. Okay, understood. When aiming the musket, extend your arm so that it's level with your shoulder and use your eye to look down the weapon's sights. Like this? Not bad. Now, try saying your lines. <clears throat> this is the end of the road for you. Good. Now turn your body a little. That way, you'll give your enemy less of a target to work with. And relax your shoulders. Here, allow me to demonstrate. This is the end of the road for you. Huh. Excuse me, Miss Chiori. Director Farina, there's something I wish to discuss with you. Oh? What is it? Like this? Yes, much better. What do you think? Mm-hmm. I do see your point. But are you sure you wish to do this? I believe it would be most fitting. Well, if you insist. All right. I understand. <clears throat> Miss Ayaka! Miss Chevris! Could the two of you please come over here? Huh? What's going on? Are we gonna start filming now? Let's go see. What is it? I have a question for you, Miss Chevris. Would you be willing to play the role of a musketeer? Uh, what? To clarify, I would like to turn over my role to Miss Chevrus. But, brother... Don't worry, Ayaka. I actually view this as a good thing. I was becoming troubled trying to set aside some time to speak to the staff at the Palais Marmonia. I would like to have some conversations about the cultural exchange between our two countries, and I've heard that the bureaucratic process here can get... rather complicated. Now, I will be able to focus on my work. Besides, you also know that I'm not really one for public performances. Are you really sure? From a director's point of view, I also felt like the relationship between the two musketeers in the original story could be improved. The older brother in the story plays the lead role with his overbearing character, but this causes his character to overshadow that of his sister, and the theme of the two supporting and relying on each other isn't conveyed very well. But, if we were to change the siblings to two sisters of a similar age, then that aspect of the story might come through more clearly. Also, I've seen you instructing Ayaka. That cold and dignified personality is exactly what we need for the older musketeer. Of course, even with all these insights, the decision should still be made by Miss Chevrus. Uh... Chevrus mentioned that she really likes the story, right? Paima bets that she'll take the role. Alright, I'll take the role. Good. It's decided then. I'll get started on making edits to the script. We'll also need to make some immediate adjustments to the lighting, props, and costumes. Oh, I have a feeling that our adaptation will be even better than the original story. You're doing a great favor for me, Miss Chevrus. You have my gratitude. Don't mention it. I like this character, so if anything, I should be the one thanking you. Well... Since my brother is the one who brought up the idea, I suppose there's no need to worry. Let's go, Miss Chevrus. I look forward to working with you. Please, just call me Chevrus. Seems like you're really going out of your way to solve the problem I was having with your makeup. Surely you jest, Chiori. 
I assure you that I was mostly motivated by a desire to spend more time on formal business. Oh, come on. You really think I'd buy that? According to what I've heard from Ayaka, her brother is someone who can juggle ten different matters at the same time. I'm sure you have other reasons for backing out. Perhaps. Ayaka always said she wanted to go out and see more of the world, just like the Traveler. But I feel that she needs not only to see other nations, but also to make some different kinds of friends. I think it would be harder for her to make new connections with me constantly by her side. I would like to give her some space. Alright, go on. Spoil her some more. Ayato! It's too bad you're stepping down from the role. Paimon really wanted to see you act as a musketeer. <laughs> no need to poke fun at me. I'd wager that you also felt that I wasn't the best candidate for the role. <laughs> it's a little hard for Paimon to imagine you saying those lines. Yes, I've made an appointment to meet some people from the Palais Mermonia. Now, I will have some more time to prepare. Traveler, get the camera ready! Paimon, get the clapperboard! Actors, to your positions! We're about to start shooting the first scene! <laughs> Go on now. And please take good care of Ayaka. Thank you. I look forward to seeing the film when it's finished. Alright, now that we're all here, let me help set the scene for everyone. The first scene takes place when our two main characters are still living at the Baron's estate. They've been ostracized and verbally abused by others in the household, but they still have no idea why. We want to capture how naive and innocent they are, despite their pain. Chevris will be playing the role of the older sister, Tulip, and Ayaka will be the younger sister, Iris. Be sure to get close-ups of the main characters at the right moment. Silence on the set! Lights! Camera! Action! Let's go! Tulip, Mother's been out for quite a while now. Mm. Perhaps she went to pick some flowers on the way home. You know how she loves flowers. Iris, Tulip, I'm home! Mother! You were out for so long, we were beginning to worry about you. Oh, I'm sorry, but I'm back now, safe and sound. Here, I brought your favorite treat, apple turnovers. Mother, what are those bruises on your hand? Huh? What bruises? Oh... I must have bumped into something while I was working yesterday. But I didn't notice them this morning. Then perhaps they're from when I accidentally tripped when I was out just now. By the way, did you have fun playing at home? <sighs> What's the matter, Iris? Well, we've realized that... No one really wants to play with us. They even took Iris's doll and spat at us. <sighs> and they even called us names. They said we were... Shh. It's alright. Don't worry. <sighs> Girls, listen to me. It doesn't matter what anyone says. Don't listen to them. No one can define you with such words. You both have wonderful lives ahead of you. Just like your names, you will both blossom like beautiful flowers. Maybe your time to blossom 
hasn't quite come yet. But one day, you two will bloom more beautifully than anything else. Don't let the soil you're in now ruin your future beauty, understand? Oh, my dear daughters. And cut! Not bad. The actor's emotions were all on point. Let's keep that take. Also, if our clapper loader could avoid shouting at the start of the scene next time... Oh, I uh, got it! <sighs> Great. I was a little worried that my nerves would get the better of me. What about you, Chevras? I felt fine. The lines weren't too difficult at all. Seems like Farina must have adapted the role nicely. <laughs> you two were great. I couldn't tell it was your first time acting in a film. You should have more confidence. Thank you for your encouragement. Positions, everyone! We'll move on to the next scene after we try a few more camera angles. This scene is when our two characters return home, only to discover their mother has been murdered. Ready? Lights! Camera! Action! Mother, we're back! Mother? <gasps> What's wrong, Tulip? Iris, stay away! Huh? Why? What's... <gasps> Mother! Mother... <laughs> She's... <laughs> huh? There's poison in this cup! Huh? <laughs> I could have sworn I've seen this kind of cup before! Those aristocrats. They didn't even try to cover up their actions. <laughs> Iris, we need to leave this place. Leave? But now that Mother is gone, where can we even go? Anywhere. All I know is that we can't stay in this house. going to let them get away with this? We'll have our revenge, I promise you. Just not right now. <laughs> Come on, let's go. No, wait. We can't just leave Mother here like this. At least... At least let me leave this rose with her. That's why we went out in the first place. To buy her this flower. All right. Goodbye, Mother. We'll avenge you. Someday. And cut! Beautiful! Great performance! You're so amazing, Ayaka! And were those real tears I saw? How did you do it? I was surprised too. Thank you for the kind compliments. Actually, as soon as Director Farina said action, I told myself not to think about anything. I just felt the weight of the moment and became the character. It's quite similar to practicing the art of the sword. You clear your mind and focus only on what's happening in front of you. Ayaka's performance was amazing. Have I discovered an acting prodigy? Pipe down, everyone! We need to move on to the next scene! Board. Hmm. 
feel, Traveler? Is your arm sore from holding the camera all day? Good work, you two. You too, Chevres. You were quite the actress today. I've read this novel many times before. I have a good grasp of my character's mindset. Anyway, do you remember my request from yesterday? Oh, right! We were having so much fun that Paimon nearly forgot! You have a case where the murders seem really similar to the cases in the novel, right? So, uh... How are they similar, exactly? In the story, the main characters grow up to become two musketeers, always using their guns to carry out their revenge. And on each of the victims, they place a rainbow rose as a signal that they've returned. Yes, that's correct. We found rainbow roses just like in the novel. <laughs> Seems like you're connecting the dots now. Oh, that does sound pretty concerning. Especially after seeing the script today! Oh, now Paimon can't stop wondering what kind of ulterior motive the murderer might have! Uh, what do you think, Traveler? You're smart! Paimon wants to hear your thoughts! Good! On behalf of Fontaine's Special Security and Surveillance Patrol, thank you for your dedication to justice. There's no time to lose. We should start investigating right away. Follow me. Huh? Right now? But well, we just got done filming all day! Paimon's so tired! The most valuable intel always comes after nightfall. They are like small, remote islands in the middle of the sea. If you don't stay vigilant, you will pass right by them in the fog. That's how one of my favorite books always puts it, at least. So where are we going right now? Let's start by checking out some workshops that sell mechanical components. If the culprit is making their own weapons, it's very likely that they'll visit those sort of places. Welcome to Le Show's Clockwork Workshop. How can I help you? Hello. I'd like to know if anyone has purchased some special components lately. Special components? Sorry, could you be more specific? I mean the kind of components that aren't typically used for clockwork toys, but for firearms. Huh? For firearms? No, no, we don't sell those sort of things here. Don't misunderstand. I'm not here to cause any trouble. We are merely investigating a case, and we're hoping that you could cooperate. Well, to be completely honest, I'm not even sure what kind of components that would entail. Has anyone ever purchased components here as an individual, rather than on behalf of an organization? We have a lot of customers who buy toys, but those who buy components are all regular customers who buy in bulk on behalf of their organization. Hmm, is that so? I understand. Thank you for your cooperation. You're welcome. It's the least I can do. Chevrus, run out of oil for your musket again? Hello, Estelle. I want to know if anyone has come to your shop recently to order some firearm components. Oh, is this another case? Hmm, let me think. I don't think so. Some people have requested that I make some prop guns for the Fontanelia Film Festival, but I refused all of those requests. 
Oh, why's that? Because there's no profit. I only make things here that can do some real heavy lifting. I don't have the energy to make some new molds just for the festival. Then has anybody come specifically looking for mechanical components? Well, hmm. I usually sell off my scrap to the Fleuve Centre. I don't typically give them to one specific person. I understand. Thanks for your cooperation. Don't mention it. Always happy to have the Musketeers patronage. Seems like we haven't found any leads to go off yet. Yeah, unfortunately. <sighs> Alright. Let's head to Fliff Sandra next. Huh? Are you sure? Uh, people might not be so thrilled to see the captain of the special patrol there. You think so, huh? Then I guess you don't know. Huh? Know what? That I grew up in Fliff Sandra. It's been a while, Tetro. Please, just get on with your request. I want to know if you've heard anybody talking about muskets lately. Information isn't free, you know. I've heard that bandits have been extremely active in the countryside recently, and they've been affecting the delivery of goods to Poisson. I can allocate some more manpower to help out with that problem. What do you say? <laughs> You're still as helpful as ever. One of our men got drunk at dinner about a month ago and lost his gun. Three days later, it turned up in the corner here. What's weird about that? He just forgot where he put it, right? This is Fleuve Sandra, my friend. Anything of value left in the tavern won't ever make it to the next day. But that gun turned out to be an exception. It didn't get any new wear and tear on it, and didn't even appear to have been fired. We were quite mystified as to what could have happened. I suspect it came back because the weapon was already known to the guards. You mean, a criminal was afraid the Marochose Phantom would use the shot marks to track them down? Maybe. But if that's the case, the culprit really took great care to avoid getting caught. I didn't say anything about a criminal. In Fluff Sandra, knowing who was killed is as easy as knowing what clothes you're wearing today. It's the guy living in the east side, isn't it? I've never liked him. Every time he's here, he just orders a drink and sits there with a nasty look in his eyes. So, who was the one who lost the gun in the first place? Eh, don't bother. Even if you ask, he wouldn't admit to owning a gun to some strangers. Not to mention the captain of the Special Security and Surveillance Patrol. He's right. I know you grew up here, Chavris. Even though you're on good terms with the Spina, you've still been gone too long. Not many people know you here now, and a lot of people don't like the Special Patrol. I know. So take my advice and don't show your face too much around here. It's for your own safety. I'll come and go as I please, and I'm afraid I'll be appearing more often due to my work. All right. Don't say I didn't warn you. I'd like to ask some questions. I don't know anything. Don't worry, I'm not here to arrest anybody. You say that now. It's the truth. Here, 
Take this as my guarantee. Wait, did Paimon just see what she thinks she saw? Is the captain of the special patrol bribing a citizen? Seems you're different from the other guards. What do you want to know? Have you heard anything related to muskets in Fleuve Sandra lately? Anything at all? Muskets, huh? All I know is that about two weeks ago, we started hearing some loud noises at night. So loud that it's been waking me up. Were they gunshots? Possibly. It's hard to tell around here. Someone's house collapsing, a pipe exploding somewhere, it's all the same. But the noises I'm talking about definitely happened after I fell asleep. Do you know where the noises were coming from? I don't remember clearly. <sighs> Is it that you don't remember, or that you need to think about it some more? You tell me. Then please, think about it some more. Uh, she's giving her even more, Mora! The noises came from the end of the southern waterway. I came out and had a look for myself and I wasn't sleeping well, but I didn't dare get too close. That's all I know. All right, I'll take your word for it. Thanks for the pot de fruit. Uh, uh. No need to be surprised. I grew up here, remember? I know how to get people around here to talk. Seems you catch on pretty quick. Now then, let's keep going. Yes, but have a closer look, Paimon. Hmm? Even though somebody has purposefully tried to clean them up, these are obviously marks from musket bullets. In other words, someone was here trying to improve their shot. They were using the barrels and bottles for target practice. Oh, could it have been the killer? Your guess is as good as mine. Although many people at Fleuve Sandra own guns, few hide the fact from others. And even fewer would go to such lengths to hide markings from practice shots. Anyway, let's go. There might be more to this. Seems like that's all we'll be able to uncover for today. Paimon feels like we managed to learn a lot more here than up on the surface. Yes. Assuming that everything we found is indeed connected to our suspect, then their timeline was probably something like this. A month ago, our suspect found a gun and took it home to disassemble it. Once he'd figured out its mechanics, he brought it back. In the following weeks, he used some parts to create his own makeshift musket and took it to the Fleuve Sandra for target practice. Then, a few days ago, he found his target and carried out the murder. Once the deed was done, he left a rainbow rose on the body, just like the scene in the novel. Hmm... That all makes sense to Paimon, but we're still no closer to figuring out the killer's identity! The deceased was a resident of Fleuve Sandra. It's said that he was a poor, solitary man. Yeah, that's also something I'm trying to figure out. If we are indeed following the novel, and there's a story behind the murder, then this murder should be an act of vengeance. But according to our investigation, the deceased didn't have any enemies. He was no saint, but no one's heard of a rival who hated him enough to shoot him dead. Much less care to leave a rose on his body. 
What message is the killer trying to convey? And to whom exactly? We've thoroughly investigated that possibility. He claims to have spent the whole day at the Opera House on the day of the murder, and the staff there have confirmed his account. Okay, so he has an alibi. Not only that, he lacks a credible motive as well. He has a family of his own, and both of his parents are still alive. I've looked into his records. He was adopted at the age of six, and all the proper procedures were followed. There are also records of him at an orphanage before then. In the story, the mother of the two musketeers was murdered after the children turned 10. Of course, he could have changed the children's ages, but I don't want to assume anything without evidence. More importantly, I've also had a chat with him in person. He didn't seem like the kind of person who would pull the trigger to kill a man. Then, what should we do now? We have all this new information, but it doesn't help us move forward. Investigations take time. I didn't expect us to catch the culprit in just a single day. How about this? Let's spend the next few days filming with the crew. We can continue the investigation once we're done with the film. I'm sure that given time, new leads will present themselves. Wait, but weren't you saying Intel is like small remote islands in the middle of the sea just a moment ago? Wouldn't you just miss them if you were to stop looking? Ah, but the book had more than one reference to the islands, Paimon. As long as you spend enough time sailing through the fog, you'll eventually come across an island.